this is perhaps a little less enthusiastic look at um, our field. And uh, what I'm trying to do today is uh, share my perspectives on uh, some of the major technical roadblocks and, and what we need to do. Um, so those uh, for those who are on Twitter and follow the academic Twitter chat, uh, you may recall that recently there was this uh, sort of series of cartoons making fun at um, papers in different fields. So uh, this is a, a cartoon that somebody made in making fun of the hydrology field. And um, you can kind of look at, you know, we all have written these type of papers. So one of the things that kind of resonated with me is that these, what they call it, the two-person improvement papers that, uh, uh, you know, we do something and, and, and it, it improved the model skill very moderately. And I couldn't help uh, think that, you know, uh, I've seen a lot of these kind of papers in the land data simulation um, world, including my own. So just not to poke or uh, take a dig at anybody, but um, just uh, I, I just grabbed a few highlights uh, from uh, a few papers, many recent ones that sort of speak to that. You know, so the paper that say data simulation improvements were barely at the statistical significant levels, and we had a simulation of SMAP basically improving the correlation by 0.03. Uh, and this is another paper that shows, you know, DA improvements, not a lot to speak of, barely at the, st at the conference interval levels. Um, and again, you know, the same theme. So it's not just limited to soil moisture. So if you look at, uh, there were some, you know, lots of snow papers that say the same thing, indicating that the filter performance is modest. Um, and and they were not able to improve upon the model. So, um, you know, so what's what's wrong here? I mean, uh, why are we still at this place? So I'm going to offer my perspectives on why uh, we are in this place uh, to a large extent. So um, looking at hydrology, um, I feel one of the things that's uh, unique about hydrology is, is the fact that uh, random errors are much less compared to systematic errors. So biases are the norm. So uh, this is a chart where we uh, compared, we quantified the uh, total error uh, of soil moisture from models and remote sensing data. And then we, um, we separated that into systematic and random error component. So the blue is this random error component um, and the red is the systematic error. So it's sort of like, fairly obvious, you know, both models and remote sensing data, the systematic error is much higher than random errors. But as through data simulation system, we are focused on improving that blue error part, um, which is sort of ignoring the elephant in the room and going after that that little itty bitty error that's already pretty good in, in the models. Um, and this is to a large extent in the soil moisture world because we don't know the global soil moisture climatology and we, as you heard about in these talks earlier, we rely on rescale estimates to get around this limitation and essentially ignoring that bias piece. And this, uh, uh, the lack of uh, soil moisture climatology is again, well established. Randy Koster really just defined this um, very clearly that the simulated soil moisture or even the retrievals uh, are not really soil moisture. They are just index of wetness. And, and that's why we have to, we can't really assimilate them directly. We have to, Kind of get around them, but the the one of the solution is to actually work towards improving that observability, which hasn't happened. Um, so I feel like that's you know again one of the key issues that uh, kind of bottles us down. So there's again um, poking again uh, at the rescaling approaches. So uh, Gray Nearing uh, published this paper in 2017, I think, um, that looked at. Um, using information theory approaches, uh, how, how effective our data simulation approaches are. And they quantified that uh, about 11% of the uh, loss of information is actually coming from these rescaling approaches. So just think for a second, we are already at barely statistical significant levels in terms of the amount of improvement we can get. And on top of that, we lose information because of all this rescaling stuff we do. So uh, I published a paper in 2015, again, uh, kind of critiquing the rescaling approaches. So when uh, unmodeled processes are present, so we used example of irrigation as an example and using 
these rescaling approaches it can actually introduce statistical errors. So here we have two time series, the solid line, let's say represents uh, irrigated soil moisture and the bottom line is the one without irrigation. So if, if your sensor is seeing that irrigated signal and you rescale that into your model open loop, you're gonna end up uh, getting either that red line or the, the blue line, and neither of which are actually uh, what we want. The red line is when we use a lumped approach to rescaling that does get you some of that wet signal, but also introduces a lot of errors in that non-irrigated time period. The If you use a seasonal approach, it, it does better, the blue line, but you're not really capturing that uh, bias signal, which understandably the algorithm is removing. So again, these are problematic. I mean, so the, the issue here, I don't think it's actually the rescaling itself. The fact that we, we can't really uh, we don't really know the soil moisture climatology, and that's why we are applying all these methods to get around it. So in Gray's paper, they also looked at, you know, again, going back to how we evaluate our assimilation approaches. The common approach is to compare against ground measurements. Um, but in Gray's paper, they showed that, in fact, when we assimilate, there may not be enough information, either in our model or in our retrievals, uh, uh, about the in-situ processes. So in this one, if you look at the information in retrievals, it's very low. Um, and therefore it doesn't really make sense to go back and compare it to in-situ measurements uh, to see if we are improving or, or, um, or uh, getting worse. So again, the evaluation metrics, similar to the assimilation strategies are focused on anomaly metrics, ignoring the basically the elephant in the room, which are uh, the, either the main source of important signals or the main sources of errors. So again, I, I sort of point to the, the need for improving the observability uh, to get around these uh, limitations. Um, so we tried a simple experiment where we, let's say we relax the observability assumption. So in the, we took the case of so SMAP as the soil moisture. Uh, we assume that there are biases in the mean, but let's say we ignore the biases in the higher moments like standard deviation and kurtosis and all that. So instead of using CDF matching, we just simply accept the anomalies from SMAP as is, uh, and then conduct an assimilation experiment. Um, you know, it's a little hard to see, but the, the bars basically show that the anomaly approach gives you about the same skill as uh, when you use a more uh, in detailed bias correction, like a CDF matching. And on the other hand, um, at locations where uh, management signals are present, like in this case, uh, we picked a location in in California where there's a lot of irrigation present. When you use CDF matching, uh, as expected, it doesn't, the assimilation doesn't really give you uh, a meaningful change. Uh, the, the assimilated signal basically sticks with your open loop. But when you do anomaly ass assimilation, it actually does better because you're sort of allowing for more uh, changes in assimilation. So again, this is just to illustrate that if, uh, if, you are in, if you in fact reduce some of these biases in your retrievals, we can actually take more advantage of uh, the information present in your retrievals uh, through data simulation system. So now uh, the other sort of objective of doing data simulation is that we connect to uh, sort of unobserved parts of the water cycle in this case. So we have simulate soil moisture so we can improve ET and root zone soil moisture. So I kind of question whether we are actually meeting that promise. So this is from, papers from my own group uh, where we looked at the impact on ET from soil moisture data assimilation. Again, you can see that the changes are minuscule. It's not nothing to get excited about barely at the statistical significance level. So this is a map from a more recent paper that we assimilate SMAP to see whether it actually improves ET. And all the red colors are places where we are supposed we improve and all the blue colors indicate locations where we degrade things. So we can see that there's not a lot of improvement. There is some improvement we get in, in the Western US uh, in, in, in those irrigated areas. Actually, this is the central California Valley, which is where a lot of irrigation happens. So comparatively, uh, if you assimilate uh, vegetation optical depths also from SMAP, we see a much larger impact on ET. We can see the signature of a lot of the uh, agricultural areas popping out. This is the Midwest. U.S. Snake River Basin, Lower Mississippi, which is where a lot of agricultural impacts are happening. So again, this is 
telling us that either when we, you know, the, the assumptions in the model about these connections to other variables is very important. So ET, for example, in the Eastern US, it's it's um, it's it's a energy limited domain. So water, or soil moisture is not really the control on ET. So therefore, assimilating soil moisture to improve ET may not really make sense. Whereas vegetation has a more direct connection, either uh, because of the, the the regime or because of the way it's inherent in the model. So these, so we again sort of go back to the model to see how these connections are designed which may not have any uh, requirements uh, from the data assimilation community incorporated. So this is another example uh, uh, from Rolf and, and we published this paper many years ago now uh, on land surface temperature assimilation. But I think the message here is still relevant. So in this case, we assimilated land surface temperature into two different land surface models, catchment and NOAA. And we basically, know that the, the prognostic, these models really lack the prognostics for assimilating land surface temperatures. So in catchment, they had a bulk representation uh, of land surface temperature, whereas in NOAA, it was like a thin uh, layer that has no memory. So because of this, this really presents a problem for assimilating uh, in being able to incorporate these measurements. And somewhat predictably, we, so again, somewhat underwhelming type of improvements or impacts from assimilation. Uh, so even now, I think more, a lot of the land surface models do not have the right prognostics to be able to take advantage of these uh, measurements, which is why I think even after multi decades of having remote sensing observations of LST, um, we still don't have a lot of papers, uh, studies that show value for it. So again, I think the point here is that we need to work with the modeling community uh, to infuse the requirements and, and to force them to have some of these diagnostics so that we can actually exploit these measurements. So uh, another question sort of I've been thinking about is, are we focused on the right type of measurements to exploit? So there's a, a ton of papers in the community looking at uh, assimilating snow cover data, which is essentially a qualitative measurement. It just gives you um, information about the presence or absence of snow. And then we, then we come up with all kinds of rules to uh, exploit uh, that information into a quantitative snowpack. So recently we tried uh, exploiting um, albedo measurements from these same sensors. Um, compared to the number of snow cover studies, I, I can count on my hand the number of albedo data simulation studies. So what we found is that uh, albedo data simulation actually gives you more impacts. So you see larger improvements. Again, the warm colors are better uh, from data simulation. It also actually degrades uh, more in many places, but um, uh, and so um, so in other words, uh, this some of these degradations uh, also has to do with the fact that the relevant mo model prognostics do not exist. So therefore, we sort of work around this. Um, so yeah, thanks. So uh, I think like some of the presentation before, we also found that focusing on uh, the land management impacts, which are difficult for the land models to represent by itself is actually has uh, given us better results. So vegetation assimilation has shown uh, the ability to capture some of those changes in phen phenology changes, uh, which the, uh, the model cannot represent even with driven with good precipitation. Um, and, and so, and, and things that are happening, uh, uh, that vegetation disturbances and so on that are man-made Again, uh, cannot be simulated very well in models. So we, uh, for example, this is a case of the Australian fires that was um, so large that even SMAP could see some of those uh, disturbances. So we assimilated uh, those disturbances, uh, changes uh, into the model, and we saw that there was a significant change in the water budget. Uh, so the post-fire conditions led to a significant reduction in ET and, and significant increase in runoff, which actually may have contributed to, to some of the flooding uh, that happened in New South Wales. Uh, final point is, the, again, I think uh, we also often look at a single measurement, but uh, looking at multivariate constraints um, may be needed. So this is an example of uh, the Indus and Ganges Brahmaputra Basin, where if you look at the LAI, it shows a significant increase from irrigation and agriculture, but all that water comes from the groundwater 
which is taken out. So if you look at the uh, TWS signal, it actually goes down. So if you only assimilate one of these, you're gonna get the right, wrong answers because if you uh, simulate only the groundwater depletion, uh, the model is gonna simulate a decrease in all your other quantities. So I'm just gonna leave with these final thoughts. So I feel like we need to get away from this 2% improvement sy syndrome. We need to kind of take a harder look at our models and our observations um, and focus on improving the observability of these uh, models and retrievals. And uh, you know the biases are a, a big issue. Uh, we need to have data simulation methods that actually address them. And we also need to talk to the model development community so that we can infuse the DA requirements so we can have the right prognostics. And finally, I think the multivariate uh, remote sensing infusion is critical for insights of human management. And this is why I think land is unique. Uh, and I think this is a huge opportunity for land data assimilation. So I'll stop there.